Welcome, everyone. I'm Lisa Lunghofer, the Executive Director of the Gray Muzzle Organization, and I'm joined by my colleague, Amanda Grant. We will be fielding your questions, so feel free to type them in the question box if you're joining us on Zoom, or you can also use the comment section if you're on Facebook Live. So I'm excited that today we are getting a head start on kicking off Adopt a Senior Pet Month, which is November by talking about the joys of senior dog rescue. And I really couldn't be more excited about our guests, both of whom truly embody, embody Gray Muzzle's belief in the value and worth of every senior dog. Before I introduce them, I just wanna share that we'll be announcing a new contest at the end of the broadcast, so be sure to stick around for that. So with that, I want to welcome Laura Coffey and David Rosenfeld. Laura is a Gray Muzzle Advisory Board member and author of the national bestseller, My Old Dog Rescued Pets with Remarkable Second Acts. She is a self-avowed dog nut and a senior writer, editor, and producer for NBC's Today Show. A journalist with more than 25 years of experience, Laura has written and edited hundreds of high-profile human interest stories for Today.com since 2008. Laura is joined by David Rosenfeld, a novelist with a special place in his heart for dogs in need. He began writing after a successful career in the movie marketing business. He's a national best-selling author whose most recent book is Silent Bite. About 14 years ago, he and his wife started the Terra Foundation in honor of what he calls the greatest golden retriever the world has ever known. They have rescued almost 4,000 dogs, many of them goldens, and found them loving homes. Their own home is a sanctuary for those dogs that they rescued but were too old or too sickly to be wanted by others. Welcome, Laura and David. With that, I will turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you to the Gray Muzzle Organization for doing this. Um, I am so excited and honored to be here today and to get to interview this amazing person I know, David Rosenfeld. It's going to be quite, going to be quite a treat for you. <laughs> No, this is going to be extraordinary. Treat. This yeah. is a treat. I know for a fact, um, firsthand. So this here, he's written um, more than 30 books, most of which are mystery novels that are so much fun to read. And as a special bonus for the crowd we have here today, all of his novels always feature dogs. And David also is the author of two excellent nonfiction dog books. And one of which is my very marked up and very well studied copy of Dog Tripping, which is awesome. And he also wrote um, Lessons from Tara. So these two, these two books are, have really affected me. If you haven't read them yet, please get them because it's worth it. And um, David lives in Maine you know, with his wife, Debbie Myers, and their many happy rescue dogs. And David also asked me to mention the fact, I hope this is okay, David. He may ask me to mention the fact, and I quote, that he's six foot two, 170 pounds with blue eyes and cat-like movements. <laughs> Did I get that right, David? I'm to 168. I haven't had lunch yet today. <laughs> so anyway, so David and I first met back in 2013 when he released that first nonfiction dog book, Dog Tripping. And I got to interview David for a story that I wrote for the Today Show's website where I work. And he was so funny. And I found the story of what he and his wife, Debbie, had done to help thousands of shelter animals to be so remarkable that I thought to myself, wow, I am so happy and grateful that I got to meet David Rosenfeld. How fun was that? Then fast forward a couple of years, and I end up writing a nonfiction um, dog book of my own. And it's, it's called My Old Dog Rescued Pets with Remarkable Second Acts. It's all about senior dog rescue. And the idea was that um, it would be so much fun to travel all over the country um, and meet people from all different walks of life all over the place um, who had done really great things to help senior dogs in need. And I was traveling with photographer Lori Fasaro, who's just a beautiful, unbelievable, unbelievably talented photographer. And she and I were traveling around the country ga gathering these stories. And what right away, very, honestly, the very first thing that crossed my mind as we started working on this book was we have to include David and Debbie in this book because they've done so much to help so many senior dogs and their story is so amazing. So today I'm hoping to be able to really convey that very happy story for everyone here. So David, I know that your journey and animal rescue began with a very special dog named Tara. And who was Tara and how did she launch you and Debbie into animal rescue in such a big way? Tara, I actually only knew Tara for about six months. She was Debbie's dog when we met. 
and about three months into that, she got nasal carcinoma and, you know, had a, it was ter- going to be terminal. And for the next three months, she was absolutely, she, we never left her alone. It was, it was, it was a transforming experience for us. And after she, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm being harassed by Irish. I don't know if you can see them. Um, uh, after Tara died, um, Debbie wasn't ready to get another dog. I was, um, but she wasn't. So we volunteered at a shelter in LA and the shelter in LA is, uh, the shelters in Southern California for the most part are absolutely horrible. So we started volunteering and decided it was too passive that dogs were being put down. What we're watching dogs being taken as guard dogs. It was, you know, you don't have to even fill out an application. Um, So we started our own foundation and that's how it happened. But when a dog that we rescued was old or blind or epileptic or whatever the reason was that we we couldn't place him or her, they came home as our pet. So that's why we wound up having a completely psychotic amount of dogs in our house at all times. So over the years, you know, I, it's been touched on briefly already, but you know, how many dogs did the Terra Foundation help and how, how did you do it? What, what, was, what was the work like that you were doing with the foundation? We rescued about 4,000. Um, in our house, we never had less than, in California, never less than 30, maybe 25 at some point. But um, we, we uh, contracted with a vet out there who gave us 25 dog runs that were dedicated to us. So when we, we would always make sure those dog runs were filled. And so if we placed 10 in a week, we'd go out and go to a shelter and get 10. And people would meet us at the vet's office for the application, for walking the dog, for a meeting process. You know, so that was our base of operations. And of course, while they were there, they got spayed or neutered and whatever health they, stuff they needed. So it actually worked out pretty well. So that, so, and that was, again, you were doing that for, was it about? 14 years total in California? No, no, in California, we were doing it for maybe seven years. Seven before yeah. you moved. So, so you started that and then, and then eventually um, the, we're going to get to this obviously, but your big trek to Maine. Then, yes. Yeah. Okay. In Maine where it's not necessary for us to place dogs. It's the rescue situation in New England was fantastic. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, what you've noticed in different parts of the country, different geographic areas of the country, you know, the plight of shelter animals. What have you observed <laughs> in the drastic differences? I mean, like I said, so you know, I'm not an expert on this stuff. Southern California is hor- mostly horrible. At least it was then. Um, the South is usually pretty bad, although, you know, it's sort of arbitrary. There are places where it's good and places where it's awful. But as at a, on a whole, the South is pretty bad. And, and they actually bring hundreds if not thousands of dogs up here uh, every week and, and certainly every couple of weeks to, um, to New England to be placed. Yeah. So, you know, so it's, it's it up here is fantastic. Down south in most places is a problem. Right, right. Well, you know, I know when I interviewed you back in the day, you told me this, this is a quote from you. It's one of my favorite quotes of all time from anyone ever. Here's the quote. It was, when you have two dogs, getting a third is a big deal. But when you have 26 and you get a call saying that a golden retriever is going to be put down at three o'clock, you take a 27. <laughs> so isn't I really that like that. Isn't that magnificent prose? I mean, I just, know, it I, is. My, <laughs> You're a genius. <laughs> but that's well established. But can you elaborate on that quote a little bit? You know, yeah, how- and it happened, I, it, I said it around a specific date. We were, we got a call from, um, a shelter in Lancaster, California, which is up in a desert country. Um, and they were putting down a golden at three o'clock, a nine-year-old golden, and they knew us. And we, if we can get there by then, you know, they, they would give us the dog. And we, of course we got there by then and got the dog. And, and that day they had put down 150 dogs at that shelter, um, you know, cause people would go up to the desert and just throw the dog out of the car. So, you know, it was just atrocious, but, um, you know, so you, but you we couldn't leave that dog there. And of course, unfortunately we couldn't rescue the other 150, but that's what it felt like. I mean, we had 26 or whatever we had at the time. And when you get that call, you know, man, it's really, you don't even notice the difference in, in a house of 26, right? <laughs> if there's a 27, yeah. you don't even notice. Yeah. So, 
how, so how did you how, how has it been how what have you observed over the years when you have that many dogs in your house at one time it sounds like it would be very very chaotic and i know that to, to a certain extent you know it's certainly very busy but how do all the dogs tend to get along they get along fine uh, that's you know there there are certain dogs that don't like certain other dogs yeah but i can't remember the last fight of any kind that happened um no, they get along fine. I mean, I don't, I don't know if rescue dogs are just uh, grateful or what, whatever the deal is, but trainers had told us in California that we could never do this. Um, so no, it, it, that's really not a problem. I mean, of course, when a dog is presented to us for possibly to take in, the one thing we have to make sure is that the dog is not dog aggressive. You know, that's a, that's the only deal breaker. That's the only thing that could be wrong with a dog that would make it impossible for us to take it. So we know that going in, but then you never know how a dog is going to react in a situation. I mean, this is, you know, you don't know how humans are going to react in a situation. Mm -hmm. So um, it would, that works fine. It really does. So, cause that's one memory I have of visiting your home was just how peaceful and calm it was. I know there was, I mean, there was that initial barking when we showed up. You were at our house. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, but our house? excitement when we came of course because that's what you know that's normal but then they all settled down and we're all loungy it was yeah, very still yeah i mean if fedex pulled up now it would sound like a fox hunt in here right you know they'd go insane <laughs> but yes when somebody comes over for the first 10 or 15 minutes you know they're excited and agitated and and then they come down and it's it's fine yeah yeah. Okay. So now, you know, to get to the part of your life where you and Debbie were ready to retire and move to Maine, that was in 2011. Um, and here you are in this situation where you have 25 mostly geriatric and mostly very large dogs living right. with you in Orange County, right? right. <laughs> and then, and here you've got to get yourself all the way across the country to Maine. What were your initial thoughts about how in the world you were going to make that huge cross country trek? With all we had those no dogs. idea. I mean, I, I, you know, we tried a lot of things. I went every book signing I had for like a year. I spent asking people if they had any ideas how we can do this. And, you know, at some somebody, so I asked everybody. If somebody emailed me, I asked them how to do it. And, you know, some people had one, one woman who was an executive at Hollywood Park Racetrack in California tried to get us um, uh, horse trailers. Oh, wow. Um, but apparently that they're open at the top and they get hot at the bottom. So we couldn't do that. We tried, you know, going to the airlines and seeing if it could work, but it wouldn't because they would have, they could only fly two or three at a time and they'd have to go to Boston because they don't fly here direct. So that didn't work. Then a lot of people said, well, you were in the movie business. Why don't you get Oprah Winfrey's or John Travolta's plane? <laughs> <laughs> sure. And then people on Facebook, somebody suggested on Facebook and then there was a back and forth no, you don't want Travolta's playing. You what? You should do this. You know, I mean, everybody went like like it was a serious suggestion. Um, so finally, almost for lack of a, any other plan, we rented three RVs, and nine. There was Debbie and I, and nine people flew in. A, a few of whom we knew. Most of them we didn't know. They were readers, um, and we flew them to California, and then we drove cross country, and it was absolutely horrible. <laughs> If you, but everybody, everybody on the trip except me thinks it was like the greatest adventure of their life. They just loved it. You know, they still email about it. I just thought it was excruciating every second of it. But that's and, my personality. And, yeah. and why was it excruciating? What, what, was, what was it like logistically? So you had enough people, you had volunteers to help you do it. But yeah, what was that were, actually like? Well, for instance, every time you stop, the dogs want to get off. Right. And if you've ever driven an RV and I never will again, they run out of gas every 20 minutes. Right. I mean, you fill up an RV with gas and you're a quarter of a mile down the road. You have a quarter of a tank left. Right. Yeah. So so they always want to get off. So we had we actually got 200 feet of plastic fencing that we set up our own dog parks every time we stop. So, you know, so we had to get the dogs, you know, and they, these were not spry dogs, right? So we had to get them off the vehicle, walk them all within the confines of this park, this makeshift park. Then every time, wherever we were, any pe people that were around came up, wanted to come see what the lunatics were doing. <laughs> so the dogs reacted to the people. It was just horrible. I mean, every second 
was torture. And yeah, um, I remember someone who went on the trip saying it was a peak life experience. Do you remember that quote? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they love it. They just yeah. loved it. Yeah. So, re so really, you didn't know a lot of these people. They just volunteered. They, they we were knew, people. We knew one, two, three of them, I think. Uh, four of them. And a couple of those just casually. Yeah. Uh, and then the rest we hadn't met, but they were really, I mean, they were amazingly selfless group of people. I mean, it's, you know, to give up a week of your life to do that was incredible. And it, it really taught me something, which is never volunteer for anything. <laughs> I, it was horrible. But, uh, you know, there, here's, I remember you saying something back when we talked, um, about this, that this taught you something about the animal rescue world, like the kind of people who really do get involved and put their heart and soul into animal rescue. You know, what, what did you learn yeah. about? Yes, but I'll tell you what crowd? really told me something. Well, actually, I learned that more vividly four years before that. In 2007, we actually bought the house in Maine and we weren't going to move until Debbie retired, whenever that was going to be. And then in 2000, just like a few weeks later, our house was caught in the fires in California and we were evacuated. We got out, the flames were there. We got out with uh, 20, it was 27 dogs at the time and on two SUVs, one of which Debbie had just rented and actually went through flames. They were like to the side of her car to get to the house, right? So we can then go out. So um, what was I gonna say? Oh, so we, we got out with 27 dogs on, on two RVs and a duffel bag. That's all we had. And we went to a hotel and the flames were at our house when we were leaving. So we were sure we lost the house. Um, so we went to a hotel and the dogs unfortunately had to go to a shelter, which was a very good shelter in Irvine run by a friend of ours. So they were well taken care of. Um, but we, we thought we lost the house and we were, we were in the hotel for eight or nine days. And for the first six of them, we, we thought there was no way we still had a house. So somebody emailed me, a woman, I think she was in Maryland, who I didn't know, but who knew, somehow knew we lived in California. And she asked if we were okay in the fires. And I said, I think we lost the house and we're gonna have to move to Maine. We're not, you know, we can't rent an apartment in LA with 27 dogs. So um, she said, uh, so I asked if she had any idea how we're gonna do this and she had no idea, but she must've put it on the internet because in the next three days, I got 171 emails from strangers telling us that if, if we come through their town, we could stay at their house, right? So like, if you come through Topeka, you and 27 dogs could stay at our house, right? <laughs> so that really, that really gave me an idea of what, you know, these, how the country is filled yeah. with dog politics. Yeah, well, and big hearted, generous people. Really, There's a culture of yeah. dog people out there, and it's amazing. And I do a lot of rescue benefits around the country, and mm -hmm. I see it all the time. I mean, these people yeah. are amazing. Yes, right. Did you yeah. lose the house? No. Amazingly, the, the yeah. fire people um, saved it. They they yeah. foamed down the house and took down the curtains, and they I mean they mounted a defense. And it was they were remarkable. Um, so no, we didn't. Uh, it's unfortunate we didn't lose the house though because Debbie was head of worldwide media for Taco Bell at the time. Uh -huh. And she was involved with MTV, a big sponsor. And they were gonna film our trip East as a reality show at the time. So had we done that, of course, I'd be John Grisham today. Right? <laughs> so, um, but no, we didn't lose the house. So, well, we our, we but that's new, uh, new, oh. Oh, please, hold it. am I gone? Who's that, who's that? I see ya. I don't see anybody. Hold on. I don't know. You still see me? Yep, I can. I can't see anything. That's pretty typical. I don't know how to resurrect this. It maybe oh, there's oh, there. Yeah, a, there. a different Zoom window. Yeah. Oh, now it's gone. Are you there? Yep. Oh, okay. Sorry. That's okay. I'm not technolo technologically uh, adept. Don't worry, but can you see things now? Can you see? I can. Screen? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Well, 
again that so that that saga of moving to Maine and having all these people help and be in that that huge adventure is chronicled in the dog tripping book which I seriously can't recommend enough it's such a good read especially now when we're all kind of cooped up at home and need cheering up I would really recommend dog tripping and you know and now I'd, I'd like to kind of fast forward to the to the spot where you and Debbie landed in Maine um, just to convey how special that spot is are we going to get to talk about your book we maybe a little at Let's the end yeah. <laughs> your, book, your book's remarkable oh, really David thank you I, for anyway I'm sorry that. go ahead what were you gonna ask no it was really fun to work on it too because we got to I mean look at the cool people we got to meet and hang out with and all the cool dogs I mean but it was so much fun working on my old dog I can't even oh. talk about peak life experiences but getting to visit you and Debbie in Maine where you landed um Lori Fusaro the photographer and I were just both so blown away um by how special that place was and one thing I thought I might do is actually read the opening, just the opening paragraph from the chapter I wrote about you and Debbie. So here, here it is, my old dog. And here's the, here's the chapter about, about you. And it starts off, dog heaven does exist. It's just outside, how do you say, is it um, Damerscotta? Yeah. Damerscotta, Maine. Right. To get there, you drive down a long winding road past rolling green hills and stands of alder trees, dogwoods, oaks, and pines. Next, you meander down two dirt roads, then follow an unpaved driveway to a spacious log cabin home with gray beams and blue trim. Note the quiet beauty of the property's um, 10 wooded acres on a lake. Then listen for the barking. You have arrived. <laughs> and it goes on about how you joke that it's like living in a Folgers commercial. <laughs> well, it is. And, but it's and we so... have no name. We had no name. It's so beautiful there. there. It feels the, only people who, the only people who could hear our barking are actually across the lake. Because hey. I guess what the water carries it or something, the sound. Yeah. So they can hear it from across the lake. So, so, you know, the thing that I noticed too when we were there is that you, there were these little touches that you had put in place to make the house extra comfortable for older dogs. Like there were little, there was a lot of thought that went into the absolute comfort and um, safety of all these big older dogs. Like, can you describe a little bit about what you kind of thought to put in place? I actually have no idea what you're talking about. Well, there were ramps. Debbie there must were, have done it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a ramp to get. There, there were stairs. There were, it was just like, it was like a little, it, it felt like it was this beautiful cabin in the woods, but it also felt like this perfectly appointed um, little assisted living center for older dogs. We have, a, we have a doggy door that's the size of the Lincoln Tunnel. And, um, and a ramp going down. So they come go in and out as they please. Yeah. Um, and the and lake. And and it's 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 a protected property, right? So they can't like get water uh, off and get lost, right? We, well, uh, we've we fenced in three acres yeah. of wood. So they go out through the doggy door into an area that's actually cement, a, a smallish area. And then there's a gate, open gate from there that leads out into the woods. And, you know, so they can go out and hang out if they want. They, in the winter, they're out all, outside all the time. They love to be out there in the winter. Summer, yeah. can't get them out, you know. So in the winter, we can't get them in. <laughs> so anyway, it was just, it just felt, it was, it, it's, you know, a new life goal for me, just saying. And now maybe, maybe um, this would be a really nice time to, to show some photos from the visit when Lori and I came. If that would be okay, we could just show a few funny, if, if I know Amanda here with Gray Muzzle was going to put up a, we have a little slideshow just for some visuals to show um, what the property looks like and what all those happy dogs in dog heaven. Is that okay? Yeah, there, here we go. Okay, so here, <laughs> so David, tell me if you can see this once it gets going. Okay, so here, this is the, this is the opening of the chapter from the mild dog book about David, it was very challenging, I recall, to figure out one dog to focus on. We had one, we, we would focus on each chapter on one main dog, but we, there were, you had so many beautiful dogs. And so we focused on Boomer at the time. And I, put, I wanted to put this up just to show this beautifully edited, edited photo of Lori Fasaro's um, here that you, I mean, so look at it and note how gorgeous it looks. And if you go to the next frame, it's pretty funny. That's how we got that photo. <laughs> So we went out, it happened to be, it started raining the day we were there for the photo shoot. And we, Lori wanted to get the natural light of um, being outside in the woods behind David's house. And so 
Boomer wasn't really interested in doing this. She wanted to be inside the house and be warm and cozy. And she didn't want to be out in the rain. Maybe she likes snow, but she didn't like rain. Anyway, the one way we could get her to stay still was for me to keep scratching her back. So I'm down, I got completely covered in mud. I'm down in the mud, scratching her back. And that's how, that's how we got the photo for the mild dog book. We okay, rescued you... Boomer. She was a great Pyrenees. We rescued her with her twin sister. Um, and literally, I mean, you couldn't tell the difference. Her name was Cheyenne and Cheyenne died a couple of years after. This was a couple of years after that. And Boomer, after you left, Boomer uh, wound up with kidney cancer and had a kidney removed and survived and did great for another couple of years. So I, we, oh, I love Boomer. I loved every dog we met. There will be more. So if we, if we go on to the next slide. So this, right. this is David and Debbie's kitchen. <laughs> Want to describe who maybe who you see there? Look how happy. Yeah, actually, the dog that I showed before is the one that's is still with us and is the one right in the front smiling. Oh, um, the one in the back, all the way that you, which we see his black and brown head in profile. Mm -hmm. He he just died recently. He was actually the last California dog that we had left. Oh, and he was well, just a fantastic dog named Benji. Man, and the others, um, we still have, it's, you know, it's hard to tell the difference. I, we still have the one right in front of Benji, the white one. Mm -hmm. Her name is Molly. Yeah. Uh, but the others are not here anymore. Oh, anyway, I just, again, they're just, once we, once they got accustomed to us being there and they calmed down, it was just happy, fun, very chill, very relaxing to be there. All right. And now the next image, let's see what. Okay, here's more. This is just more showing David in his home with the dogs milling about six, and- That six foot two, 170 pound guy in the yeah, back. I, right, I know, I know. And, and the, I mean, clearly the cat-like moves are there, they're, they're, he's about to pounce. <laughs> yeah, deceptive. He's much, much taller than it looks in this picture. <laughs> and then let's see, let's see what else is next here. Oh, this Lori Fasaro, just the other night, she found some old like outtake blooper photos from that day. These aren't from the book. These are just photos of us having our adventure. Um, you called it, a, if it was, you said for dog lovers, if this was Disney, it would be an e-ticket ride. <laughs> Do you remember that quote? That's how it yeah. felt. Anyway, so that's me with my, my dog tripping book, hanging out with the dogs. And then what's next? We'll see. There's Lori. There's Lori Fasaro. And who's that standing on the table? Wanda. Yes. Wanda and a at, Mastiff. And Wanda, that's why you made that really big dog door, right? <laughs> For Wanda, yes. She actually, she, you know, she's died a while ago. And we have now have three Mastiffs. Uh, each one, Wanda was 170 pounds. So each of our three are 180 pounds now. Wow. Uh, yep. And, and um, like Wanda, actually. And this is a fun, a fun uh, little uh, trick that Lori does. She'll let the dogs smell her camera and look at her camera, and then they're, then they're, they're they play ball more afterward. There's another photo I think of Wanda next. That's look at that. Is that yeah. cute? <laughs> Wanda and a Bernese Mountain Dog named Bernie used to get up on a dining room table on the coffee table there because it could help them see outside if somebody pulled up sitting. There. Yeah, yeah, but I remember that there was that table was really that must be a very sturdy table. It was, uh, it's still there, actually. Yeah, yeah. That's really, we take real good care of our furniture, as you can see. <laughs> Look how beautiful it looks! Fine, it looks amazing. All right, so now the next image. Let's see what's. The, oh, that's Boomer again. This was when the Mild Dog Book first came out. Our publisher used this image as a little um, promotional event thing to to get people to. <laughs> comment and share about their old dogs. And Boomer was a hit, a social media hit with a hashtag. <laughs> and so it was just so much fun. That's the, that's your deck in the back. And then let's see what's next. Oh, the dog tripping cover again, just that, that's the story of the big move from California to Maine, which is so fun. And then I think the next one's maybe just the mild dog cover. So that's the mild dog cover. Again, look at that photo Lori got for that cover. Isn't that funny? That, that's a rescue dog named Stacy. Everyone thinks it's a boy, but that's a girl. Mm. And there's a quote from David Rosenfeld on the cover. Check it out. So <laughs> I, can't, I can't read it. Well, it was a nice quote. 
about the mild dog book. So thank you for that. Okay, so good. yeah, so I think, yeah, so that was a, the little slideshow. I just thought it'd be fun to show kind of where you landed. Um, and <coughs> one, one thing I, that stood out to me, just to talk about the reality of caring for senior dogs. Sydney, it, stop. Sydney's oh. blind. Oh. So when, when she's disoriented, she barks. She'll, 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 she'll stop in about 10 or 12 hours <laughs> barking. <laughs> oh, honey, it's okay. So I just know, you know, it is, the reality is that it can be very expensive to help older dogs with their different various health issues and things. And I know you mentioned a detail that's in the chapter in the mild dog book um, that you and Debbie have spent nearly a thousand dollars a month on dog food and $30,000 a year on vet bills. And that you've also become really accustomed to administering about 60 pills a day to dogs with arthritis, epilepsy and other ailments. Now, obviously you've had a lot of dogs, but what would you say to people who look at those kinds of details and go, whoa, 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 I don't know if senior rescue, senior dog rescue could be for me. It seems like it's just too costly. I, I don't know that, I guess it's slightly, I mean, any dog you get hopefully is going to be a senior, right? So it's not an issue of whether to do senior rescue or not. I mean, the goal is to get the dog to be a senior. Yes. Uh, but I mean, those numbers are for, you know, for psychotic people who have 25 dogs. They're not for somebody who wants to go you know, get an older dog. So no, there's senior rescue is the best. There's it's yeah. it's absolutely unbelievably rewarding. Is it? Why is it so rewarding? Do you say? Would you say? I'm sorry. Why would you say senior dog rescue in particular is so rewarding? Because I'll say by definition, though it's not quite that much. You you if you if a dog is there to be rescued. It's obviously has some problems in its life. I mean, possibly not, but most likely it's only there because it's been dumped or mistreated or something's happened to put it in that state that was, and it wasn't the dog's fault. So to be able to give it a last chapter, um, it's just, it's really nice. You know, mm -hmm. it really, I mean, I, I just, I can't recommend it enough. Right, right, right. And, you know, and one thing I will say, you know, this, this issue of cost, it's, it's a real thing, you know, we're, when we, we need to take care of our four-legged friends, right? The one thing that really impresses me about the Gray Muzzle organization, who, who's hosting this event today, is that they, thanks to donors, they take the donated money that they get and they issue grants to cover just these kinds of costs, you know, so they have medical expense grants and they have grants to help with dental care and all these things that can become very costly, like a costly surgery or costly dental work. Mm -hmm. And if, if somebody's in that kind of a pickle where they're thinking that they, they don't know what to do and they don't know, and they might be on the brink of having to give up their dog, relinquish their dog because they can't afford some kind of serious veterinary care, gray muzzle grants often will kind of swoop in and save the day for people. So it's really, really special and important. And just, you know, since you're, you've been involved with so many different rescue groups over the years as well, how important do you think these kinds of efforts are to try to help people keep their dogs in, in the home rather than ending up in the shelter in the first place? I, you know, I think they're extraordinarily important. And, and it's, you know, gray muzzle. I, I can't tell you how many comments I got when I put out on Facebook that I was going to be doing this, how many comments from people who knew the organization and said it was fantastic. Um, but, you know, like, there's a group here in, near, near us in Damariscotta that just gives out food the people who have dogs that they can't, you know, they don't have enough money to feed. So there's people, there's people all over. I'm telling you, there's a dog subculture out there. That's remarkable. remarkable. Right. That's true. That's true. And, you know, so gray, gray muzzle does the grants on a national level to all kinds of successful, you know, um, dog rescue efforts all around the United States. And they vet these efforts very carefully, make sure that the money is going to two dogs specifically. Um, and then locally, there are so many groups here too that it, near me in Washington state, there's Old Dog Haven. Um, and there are so many other groups that do these remarkable things to help cover the costs, you know, so it can kind of take away some of that fear um, and solve for that for people. And um, in the back of the mild dog book, we did include a very comprehensive state by state resource guide of all these groups that do this kind of thing. Um, and it's, it can make it possible, you know, to right. either keep your dog or even consider taking in a dog that's already had all its veterinary work done. And then you can take that senior dog in and give it a nice life, um, knowing it's ready to go have fun and feel good again, <laughs> you know? And, you know, my, ne my next question has to do with the issue of um, people who might think it would be too sad 
to take in a senior, um, the, the, the grief concerns. You addressed that a bit in your lessons um, from Tara book, <laughs> but you, what would you say to people who have that kind of concern? Like, I don't think that my heart can handle it. It'd be too sad. I mean, it, of course it's sad when a dog dies, but you have to change your mindset. You really have to, you have to um, just focus on the fact that w for whatever amount of time the dog had, it was loved and happy and safe, right? And if you can do that, then then it makes it much easier. I mean, we, you know, we're an unusual exception because we lose a lot of dogs. You know, when you rescue only seniors, you lose a lot of dogs relatively quickly. Um, but as long as you focus on what's important and, you know, it's sort of not about you, it's about the dog. If you, if you do that, then, you know, it's, it, you, it, it's more rewarding than it is sad. It's certainly sad, but you move on and you save another one, you know, if you want to. Um, mm -hmm. So I, it, it bugs me a bit that um, when people don't rescue seniors for that reason, it sort of bugs me, you know, because, you know, dogs die, you know, you know, and, and, and you, fo you should focus on what's good about them. Uh, you know, if you, if, you know, if you don't, if everybody dies, right. If you don't want uh, to be around somebody who's going to die, don't go visit your grandmother. You know, I mean, it's, you know, it sort of bugs me though. Everybody has a right to do what they want. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I know in your lessons from Tara book, when you kind of talked about this, you were saying, listen, I'm not trying to say that people who rescue senior adopt seniors are so much better than people who don't, but just please don't base your decision on the fact that the dog is going to die. That's kind yeah. of what you were, you right. were saying, right? Exactly. It, yes. And, and I know, I know that you're, you'd never minimize the grief factor. I mean, the story of what you and Debbie went through when you lost Tara still stays with me all these years later. I mean, the grief is, is a real thing, but like you said, the, um, that happiness of knowing what if you hadn't stepped in and what if you hadn't done it, what would happen? What would have happened to that poor dog? <laughs> well, we know, right? The you dog about Tara now or? No, I'm talking about just dogs, senior dogs in general, like the, the fact, I'm just, yeah, right. musing on that fact that, that if, if we didn't step in and, and take them in. Correct. Yeah, and, and it, it really is something to see. I mean, I've got, I've got like my, here's Coco. I'll show you Coco. <laughs> Coco's life is really awful. So no, but she, <laughs> she's very excited to be here. But she's so happy. And, you know, we took her in at 10 and I can't, I, I'm so attached to this dog now. I, I mean, I'm never, I'm not eager to think about ever losing her, but I'm good. I know it's going to just make me happy in the grand scheme of things that here, here is this beautiful dog who got to have so much fun, you know, and be so content. Excuse me for one second. Okay. Yeah. I am sorry. That's we, have a, we have a 14 year old golden who um, sort of has an issue with bowel, with bladder control. So she just had a major accident. So I wanted to put a towel on it so nobody else steps on it. It was not too graphic. <laughs> you know, and that reminds me of another detail from our visit is just that there were, the, there were some dogs who were still happy and eating and content and, but maybe they had some accidents and you didn't, it didn't, you, you, you and Debbie seem to be very focused on the dignity and the comfort of the dog and not getting mad or upset that maybe, or overly frustrated that there might be an accident. Yeah, and she's very comfortable and she's eating really well and everything. I mean, she's, you know, she's an old, really old dog, um, but she just got up and actually made it outside. So all's good. Good, good. You know, there, there's another um, passage that I've been thinking about a lot lately. It's from your dog tripping book. It's near the end of dog tripping and you, um, it seems very valuable to maybe mention now, especially at this, sadly, at a time when people seem to be feeling very much more divided from one another, maybe even than just a few years ago. I'm going to read the passage from the end of dog tripping. You wrote, if I've learned one thing during our descent into dog rescue lunacy, it's that dogs bridge gaps between people. They smooth over the human condition and they provide an extraordinarily valuable function. They take people of all political persuasions, religious faiths and geographical locations and represent something that everyone can love. The value of that really cannot be overstated. Is that Shakespeare? So, that was Shakespeare, I know. <laughs> See, yeah, you're, you're, like yeah. you, you're on track to get that Nobel Prize. Is that for, really from dog tripping? That's from dog tripping. That actually How sounds profound is that? 
now it's much more mature than, <laughs> than what I thought I would write. I, I, I literally have no recollection of writing that. Uh, you, you have this section about the, the power of dogs to bring people together and um, bridge gaps. And uh -huh. now thinking about that, have you, how have you seen that you know, kind of manifest itself over the years? And how important is that, that special superpower of dogs? Uh, I love to say that it works fabulously, but it, it, it establishes a, something of a kinship between people who wouldn't otherwise have it. Okay, so for instance, uh, without getting political, I, I get a call one day from um, in California. It was a call from somebody answering an ad, wanting wanting to adopt a thirteen year old Chow mix that we had that was abandoned at our vet, and um, I thought I recognized the voice of the person who was talking, but I couldn't place it. Right, so it turned out it was Charlton Heston right, was calling to adopt Willie, this 13 year old child mix, because he had a 14 year old child mix that had just lost his sibling and he wanted it. So anyway, so Charlton Hess and I are in different places politically, right? But it was remarkable, you know, so he was great, you know, he gave us a donation every year, it was terrific, right? So, so there's, um, uh, it definitely brings people together because there's a, they share a common love for something, right? And that's dogs. Um, you know, it's not going to prevent wars or anything, but it, it's a nice touch, you know? Yep. That's true. That's true. And so I don't know. I've been thinking about that a lot lately and how um, it, it seems like the, the, the dog realm of the internet, it seems like a very safe and friendly place to hang out. Other places aren't that fun right now. <laughs> oh, like I think it is. When people start talking way, about dogs, they're all to, like, we're all in agreement. This is awesome. If anyone's looking to send me a dog video or a picture, I've gotten 30 of them before you're ready to even send it to me. I, I <laughs> hundreds every day, right? So, yeah. Like, and it's great stuff. It's great it is, stuff. And it's it, nice, nice people who love animals and want to do right. good things for them. So it's just, yeah, it's, it's a part of the internet that I personally enjoy. But um, so David, really, is there, is there anything else that I've, you know, forgotten to ask you or that you'd really like to say or stress about how meaningful it can be to rescue and spoil a senior dog who needs a loving home? I think we've covered it. it it's, there's nothing, it's, it's, it's the most rewarding thing we've ever done and there's nothing in second place. I mean, it's really remarkable. Um, and, you know, the whole, and they're so smart. You know, it's like, so you know how they can feel like they, there's routines that they have, mm -hmm. like the dog that just went outside, the really old dog. Every morning after breakfast, she comes, Debbie and I are sitting in the chair watching television. She'll come over to us and just stare in our face, right? And that's a cue for us to get up, take her into the bathroom and give her a special chewy. So she'll stare in our face. And as soon as we make the slightest move to get up, she turns and goes into the bathroom because she knows what's happening. Right. So it's like, and they all have the, their own routines. And, so they're just smart. Mm -hmm. And as a part of that, they feel things, you know, and you can see when they're afraid, when they're, you know, so it's, you know, it's just to be able to give creatures like that who are that smart and that sensitive and that fearful and that certainly loving, to be able to give them a safe environment in which to live out their lives is just really nice. That's all. Mm hmm. Okay, well, thank you so much, David, for sharing all these great things. And we, now maybe we can just see if there are questions from um, people here in the chat or on Facebook. <laughs> there is one question here that I'm seeing. Well, first of all, thank you both very much. That was really touching and entertaining. And I just really thank you both for sharing your insights and experiences. Um, we have one question that says, um, can both of you share tips or ideas for people who want to do larger scale dog rescue out of their homes, but worry about the financial costs, feeling unable to travel or their ability to manage the behavior of so many dogs? I'm thinking these concerns might make some people like me afraid to jump in, but hoping there must be some ways to address these issues. David, that sounds like more of a question for you since you've done this for so many years. <laughs> yeah, but I, I don't know that I can you know, without knowing the person's individual situation and so on. I mean, all I, all I would suggest is do it slowly, 
don't start off with multiple, you know, to rescue one dog, see how it goes, decide how you like it. And, you know, and, you know, figure out the cost, whether you can handle it. Um, doing it out of your home, doing rescue out of your home with a lot of dogs is really tough. I mean, uh, you know, you, you, you really need some place to do it. Um, but you, it, everybody's different and you can make it work, but you really should go slowly, not jump in um, too quickly. I think that would be a problem. I mean, you know, we, we did it very slowly. We, um, we rescued one dog, we were, at, we were at this shelter and a guy comes in with his, we're in, a, in Baldwin Park, California. We're in a shelter in the lobby, Debbie and I, and a guy comes in with his three kids. They're like in the 10 year old range and um, he's turning his dog into the shelter, right? They don't want it anymore. Dog's a year old. We overhear, and when in that shelter back then and maybe now you have to sign a paper saying that after an hour, they can put the dog down, that you understand that, right? Because if they're overcrowded or whatever and there's no owner to find anymore, the owner's here, right? So. Anyway, so it turned out they were turning the dog in and we overheard them talking and um, they were going to, um, the, they had gotten the dog as a puppy 10 months earlier from that shelter. And now it was full grown, it was not a puppy anymore. And they were gonna, they were turning it in and signing a paper saying it could be put down after an hour. And then they were going to the back to get a puppy, right? So <laughs> Debbie annihilated this guy in the lobby, right? Just tore him a new one right while i was off to the side pretending i had no idea who she was um so that was a that was the first dog we rescued and and so we but it happened slowly you know and as we took dogs home uh that was very slow you know it was one every couple of months but then it started to build and build um so anyway the answer is, which is not a great one is just to do try what you can do but do it slowly to make sure you can handle it but David, how re realistically, how hard has it been for you and Debbie to take vacations when you've had this many dogs hard, in your home? It's not hard at all. It's not hard at all. Um, what do you do? There's two women who are friends and, and also dog sitters, and um, they're fantastic. They just take over, and they're better. They're, the dogs are better cared for when we're not home. And Boomer, actually, the dog you showed, was a perfect example. Because when, when I described Boomer as having kidney cancer, we were away. And one of our dog sitters noticed that Boomer just wasn't right and took her, took her to the vet. I don't think I would have noticed that. Um, and that's what saved her. So, so uh, you know, uh, yes. No, it's not hard at all. With the right? Not hard at all. Yeah. Trust you have to have the right situation. Right? Yeah. Correct. One thing I would add just in response to the question is that there are so many rescues and shelters that really do need help um, taking care of the senior dogs that they take in. So volunteering at your local shelter or rescue, offering to foster senior dogs who may need some extra care. You know, a lot of senior dogs don't do well in a shelter environment. So stepping up and offering to take those senior dogs into your home as, as fosters is a tremendous way to contribute to the well-being of senior dogs. If, you know, starting your own rescue is, is certainly a, a big undertaking and, and not something everybody can do, but there's lots of more modest ways that are just as impactful. That's a much better answer than mine. In fact, I withdraw my entire answer. Strike, <laughs> strike my entire answer. I, I, was, I was just going to say, Lisa, too, that there, there's this whole how to help section in the back of the mild dog book, and it's all those kinds of things, like these various ways to put a toe, dip a toe in and get involved in help. And, um, and, and or you could go completely uh, to the, to the uh, descent into dog madness, as David said, you could go completely crazy and have all kinds of dogs in your own home, but you don't have to do that. There's so many ways to help senior dogs who need right. the help. Tell the court reporter to strike my entire answer from the record, okay? <laughs> that was exactly right. <laughs> well, you can also go to the Gray Muzzle website at graymuzzle.org. And if you um, look on the grants page, you can search by your state. You can find the organizations that we have funded uh, by year. And um, perhaps there's one in, in your geographic area that is working specifically on behalf of senior dogs that you could volunteer with or support in some other way. Are there any other um, questions? I'm not seeing
see any other questions. Amanda, any questions that you're seeing? Um, there's, I saw a couple in the chat box that I felt kind of went in conjunction with each other. So somebody wanted to know how many dogs you currently have, David? We have 13. It's a, historic, then, it's a historic low for us, actually. And then in follow-up to that, somebody else asked, how much time do you spend giving baths, going on bed appointments, all the normal dog routine type things with 13 dogs? Uh, I mean, with 13, we have we go to the vet less often than we have 30, but we're there a lot. Um, and during the day, we have a we have a routine pretty well established during the day. The the process in the morning, feeding, changing the water, giving out all the meds and everything, it takes about an hour. Um, and then the same thing at night. Um, so it's really not too bad. The vet, you know, the vet takes up takes up a lot of time. Um, but it's 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 not it's not onerous at all. I mean, what used to take a lot of time was when we were doing placing dogs in homes, that was really time consuming. But now, just in our house, not that much time. I think those are all the questions that I am seeing right now. Amanda, anything to add? Let's see. I, um, there's a nice comment. Um, I've had many senior dogs in Northern California. I'm a bit burned out thinking I can't acquire any more dogs, but I am inspired to continue. I just stumbled across Gray Muzzle and this web broadcast. So thank you. I thought that was nice. Yay. I just saw a question pop up. It asked if we remember every dog's name and there's no question. I mean, I, I, we know everything about every dog. And we do knew that when we had 35. And in fact, when we made the dog tripping trip, we did it on three RVs. One had nine dogs, another had nine, and a smaller RV had seven. So each per, each per human was assigned to one RV and it was the same dogs each time. So most people only had contact with the nine, nine or seven that were on the trip, except for when we walked them. And by the, in the five days, by the time we got to Maine, every human knew every dog's name, even the ones they weren't hanging out with. So yes, once, once you see that they have a personality, then you, you, knowing the name is, is natural. Did another question just pop up, maybe for David? I saw it maybe in the chat, I'm not sure which. Yes, yeah. was... we have one comment. Somebody loves your books, David. And another one. Can we bring a person on to talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, and this is a good segue. Someone else um, says that she loves the books about your dogs, lessons from Tara and dog tripping. Do you plan to write any more about them? No, I actually um, exhausted my dog expertise in those two books. In fact, when I got to lessons from Tara, it, it, when you sign a contract to write a book, it's supposed to be a certain number of words. And like 90% into lessons from Tara, I just like ran out of dog stuff. So if you look, so I would do things like, um, in, I, instead of saying I took Cheyenne to the vet, I'd say, I got the leash. I walked over to Cheyenne, put it on her. We walked out to the car and we went to the vet, right? That's another 20 words. So no, I've, um, I've definitely used up all my dog stuff. I, I have no more nonfiction dog books to write. All right, fair enough. All right, I don't see any new questions. So any final words from either of you before I talk about our contest that we're launching today? No, go ahead. Yeah, go Laura. ahead. Laura. I'm good. Laura, anything? All right, well, thank you both. I really appreciate it. We, um, we had some very positive feedback in the chat box and um, I'm sure that everybody really enjoyed our time together this afternoon. It's a welcome, happy break <laughs> from what is sometimes not welcome, happy news. So thank you both. And so I just want to end by letting everybody know that in celebration of Adopt a Senior Pet Month, which is November, today we are getting a head start and launching the hashtag Adopted a Senior Dog Contest. So we're asking everybody who adores an old dog to help spread the word by sharing 
why they adopted a senior dog on social media. So what is it about your pup that steals your heart? Um, you can share the unique qualities that make your senior dog shine by entering the contrast. You just need to post a photo and some brief comments on your choice of social media. And also, um, it would be great if you could also post those comments in our comment section on our Facebook page um, with the hashtag adopted a senior dog. We will choose 10 winners who will receive a copy of either Laura's book, My Old Dog Rescued Pets with Remarkable Second Acts, or um, David's Dog Tripping book. Um, we'll be accepting entries until November 16th, so please, I encourage everybody to participate and help spread the word about how wonderful senior dogs are. You'll not only be celebrating the love you share with your own pup, but also helping to inspire others to give a senior dog a second chance. All right, on that note, I will thank you both again and wish everybody a good rest of their day. Take okay. care, everybody. Thanks. Thank Take you. care. So, so long, Laura. So long. Bye. 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 Bye.